Welcome to EPG Patshala. I'm Dr. T. Vijay Kumar. I'm a professor of English at Usmania University, Hyderabad. Today, we are going to discuss the module on Aikwe Armas, the beautiful ones are not yet born. This is in the paper titled African and Caribbean Writing in English, in the subject English. This module will have the following sequence. First, we will begin with some basic details about Arma and his novels. Then we will talk about the beautiful ones are not yet born. Then we will look at the significance of the title of the novel. Then I'll try and explain the context of the novel. And then we will look at the allegorical features of the novel. And lastly, the dominant imagery in the novel. So this is the sequence that we are going to follow in this module. First, basic details about Arma and his writing. Aikwe Arma is a leading writer from Ghana, born in 1939. His first novel, The Beautiful Ones Are Not Yet Born, was published in 1968 and with that novel Arma became internationally well known. He followed it up with other novels like Fragments 1970, Why Are We So Blessed 1971, 2000 Seasons 1973, The Healers 1978 and Osiris Rising 1995. Arma, as I said, is a writer from Ghana and The Beautiful Ones Are Not Yet Born was his first and also even today his best known novel. This was published in 1968 and it is the story of an unnamed railway clerk who is throughout the novel who is simply named the man and his inability to fit into a society where bribery and corruption have become the norm. The man, despite the family pressure and ample opportunities, manages to remain a non-participant in what seems to have become the national game of corruption. He is obviously considered a fool, a failure, a coward, both by his family as well as his colleagues. And what is puzzling is that the man himself seems unsure of what, whether what he is doing is right or wrong. He is completely confused about his attitude towards the corruption that he sees all around him. But at the end, his self-doubts are resolved quite unexpectedly when his classmate, who has now become a very powerful minister in the government, comes to seek shelter in his house because in a military coup, the government of which he was a part is now uh, dethroned and he is running for his life. The Beautiful Ones Are Not Yet Born is a profoundly pessimistic novel. It captures the mood of Ghana, but not only of Ghana, but of several other countries in the first decade after their independence. Ghana was the first major country in Africa to become independent. It became independent in 1957. Ghana, as you know, was earlier called Gold Coast. And Ghana becoming independent in 1957 was a kind of an inspiration for other African nations to seek independence. And Ghana is a relatively prosperous country and, uh, and a rich country too. But what the 60s and the beautiful ones are not yet born is definitely a novel of the 1960s. The 1960s in Africa was the decade of independence because several African countries became independent during the 1960s. 
but the 1960s was also what was known as the decade of disillusionment because many African countries which became independent soon slipped into uh, disarray and where the civilian governments were dethroned uh, by, you know, by the army and the civilian government gave way to military dictatorships. So the euphoria that surrounded independence in the early 1960s soon dissipated and there was a mood of disappointment, of frustration, of deep disillusionment that seems to have been very prevalent in the 1960s in several countries in Africa. That's why literary works of that decade reflect the mood of disillusionment of the 1960s and there are, there are very few other uh, novels which capture the mood of the 1960s as well as the beautiful ones are not yet born. That is probably why the, no the novel became one of the cult novels of the 1960s of Africa. Arma was described by the well-known Nigerian writer Chinua Achebe as a brilliant Ghanaian novelist, but Achebe also called him an alienated native. And this view of uh, Achebe was, uh, Achebe wrote this in one of his essays, uh, which was titled Africa and her writers. Arma, of course, uh, uh, replied in a very angry manner, and he took up the issue with uh, Chinua Achebe and argued that he was as much a native as anybody else was, that he was not an alienated, uh, foreign educated, uh, been to, but he was very much uh, a Ghanaian. Now let us look at the title of the novel. The beautiful ones are not yet born. And you may have noticed that there is a spelling error in the way in which the word beautiful is spelled. This is not a typo, but this was a deliberately misspelled word. And the title of the novel is taken from a very flowery slogan that is written at the rear of a bus, of a public bus. And as you know, uh, uh, you know, lorries, trucks and buses very often sport uh, a very philosophical and sometimes very profound statements, you know, at the rear uh, of uh, their vehicles. And this slogan appeared, you know, at the back of a bus and from there, uh, Arma took this title, The Beautiful Ones Are Not Yet Born, and uh, ironically, the word beautiful is spelt wrongly. And there is also the deliberate juxtaposition of the philosophical profundity of the slogan and the mundane context where it appears. Remember, this is a very you know, the beautiful ones are not yet born is a highly philosophical statement, but it appears at the back of a you know, road transport bus and also it is corrupted in terms of its spelling. So there is an ironical uh, gap between what the title seems to say, what the slogan seems to say and the way it appears. But Arma also said that the title a quote to quote Arma, expresses the meaning of the text as accurately as any title can. In fact, the title can connect us to two very different uh, incidents in Ghana. Uh, not exactly Ghana, but in Africa. The title, for example, may refer to the bust of Queen uh, Nefertiti, uh, you know, the, the, this bust is one of the most beautiful uh, pieces of excavation uh, that has been uh, found in Egypt. And uh, the name Nefertiti literally translates to the beautiful, fun, the beautiful one has come. And this bust of Queen Nefertiti was found by Ludwig uh, you know, a, a German archaeologist in 1912. And after it was discovered, excavated, 
it was shifted to Germany and today it is in the Egyptian Museum in Berlin. Now this is one connection between so what this title may suggest is how the wealth the artistic wealth of Africa has been stolen from Africa by the colonizers. So that could be one link between the title of the novel and the bust of uh, uh, Queen Nefertiti which literally means the beautiful one has come. But Arma takes it back, takes the history back and links the title to an Egyptian god of transition, resurrection and regeneration. This is a name, this is the god named Osiris. And according to Arma, the phrase beautiful one is ancient, at least 5000 years old. To professional Egypt Egyptologists, it is a praise name for a central figure in ancient Egyptian culture. The dismembered and remembered Osiris, a sorrowful remind of our human vulnerability to division, fragmentation and degeneration. And at the same time, a symbol of our equally human capacity for unity, cooperative action and creative regeneration. So Arma is linking the title to this mythical Egyptian god who symbolizes both the danger of disintegration but also the hope of reintegration. And therefore, Arma is linking the title of the present to a mythical past which he believes is the common heritage of all African writers. Now the immediate context of the novel. The novel The Beautiful Ones Are Not Yet Born is set in the Ghana of 1965-66. As I said, Ghana became independent in 1957 and its first prime-minister and then president was the towering figure of Kwame Nkrumah. And this novel is set in the last few months of Kwame Nkrumah's regime. And Kwame Nkrumah ruled from 1957 when Ghana became independent till he was ousted in a coup on 24 February 1966. Nkrumah was a very controversial figure and there are people who deify him as uh, the, the, the creator, the builder of modern Ghana. But also there are people who criticized him for being very egocentric and a man who promoted a personality cult and who in a way did not fulfill the promises that he made to the people before independence. So Ghana, modern Ghana after independence is linked to the figure of Kwame Nkrumah. And this novel looks at his, uh, what happened to Ghana during the last phase of Nkrumah's rule. Because Nkrumah's last phase of his rule, Nkrumah was accused of withdrawing from the people, uh, becoming too dependent on bureaucrats and leaving the country to corrupt uh, bureaucrats and politicians. So Kwame Nkrumah was a figure both revered as well as criticized uh, in Ghana. Now this novel has a limited set of characters, a small set of characters. Obviously the central character, the protagonist of the novel, is a man who is simply called the man. He has no name, he is anonymous and he is simply referred to as the man. And his wife, Oyo, is a very ambitious woman. She wants her husband to become rich like everybody else, like many of his classmates have become very rich, very influential. And she also wants her husband to become equally rich and influential. The man, however, is unable to be corrupt, not because he believes in what he is doing, but simply because he is very passive, 
he is inactive and very often he is defined by not what he does but what he does not do and what he does not do is to take bribes or indulge in corruption so the man is often beset with self doubts whether what he is doing is right or wrong whether what others are doing is right or wrong and whether he is correct in denying luxuries and pleasures of uh, mundane things to his family and his well wishers so the man is often uh, confused and to seek clarification he goes and confides in a man who again is simply called teacher teacher too does not have any name so the man goes to teacher confides in him and the teacher ironically has no answers to give because the teacher is as confused as the student but the teacher tells the man of his own life and how he became aloof you know from the rest of the society he lives a lonely life a life cut off from others and this is what he tells the man then the next important character in the novel is a kind of a counterfoil to the man here is a man called joseph kumson now joseph kumson was a classmate of the man but he began as a dock worker but today he is one of the influential ministers in the government because he has risen by mouthing the right slogans at the right time and doing the right thing at the right time so kumson today is a very powerful minister and he in a way contrasts with the failure of the man and kumson's wife estel kumson is a kind of a caricature of a socialite uh, who is very superficial and very pretentious and a very snobbish wife of uh, the minister kumson there are a few other characters like the mother in law of the man etc but these are really the major characters in the novel this novel although it looks like a very realistic novel is really an allegory of post independent ghana allegory as you know is a story which has more than a surface meaning and two major features of an allegory are one abstract names and two a belief in transformation so allegories use abstract names personifications and they also have an underlying belief in transformation but the beautiful ones are not yet born you know defies these two conventions of an allegory it looks like an allegory because it uses for example very allegorical names very descriptive and uh, abstract names for example the protagonist as we said is just called the man and his confidant and guide is simply called teacher then there is a luxury hotel which is brightly lit and it looks completely out of place in a surroundings which are very poor and this hotel is you know has a very descriptive name which is you know the title the, the name of the hotel is atlantic caprice and then there is a boat a fishing boat which the minister kumson uh, wants the man to enter into a business deal with and this boat which is seen as an instrument of social mobility is called a head so these are all obviously very allegorical name where the names reveal what the characters are supposed to be but as i said the beautiful ones are not yet born is not a simple allegory unlike in a traditional allegory in this novel there is an ironic gap between what the names suggest and what the people are for example the man the protagonist the man is hardly 
the everyman and he is definitely not the ideal man but most appropriately he is a confused man he is a man who is completely aloof and therefore he is not really a man of the people but he is an unrepresentative man similarly the teacher has no students because the teacher has cut himself off from the rest of humanity and he lives a lonely aloof and in a way a very barren life and the teacher is no better in terms of clarity so although the names the man and the teacher seem to suggest that this is about an every man and a wise man the teacher actually the man is not the every man and the teacher is definitely not the wise one now anyone who has looked at this novel anyone who opens this novel is struck first by the very powerful scatological imagery that is uh, that fills this novel the novel is full of images of filth of rottenness of things which are putrid things which are very you know uh, which are not very pleasant and in a way this is a very dirty novel because dirt filth and rot are the most dominant set of sets of imagery that you find in this novel this is a novel as i said which deals with how the man is offered a business deal by the powerful minister kumsan and this is in the form of a boat where the minister says that he cannot have the boat in his name but he he offers to get that boat in the name of the man and of course as a as as a as a, a as a kind of a bribe he promises to give a uh, fish in return to regular supply of fish in return to having the man's name as the owner of the boat the man of course is not tempted and he refuses to sign the papers the contract papers but he does not stop his wife from signing those papers this is just one instance of how the man refuses to be part of a corruption part of corruption and yet does not do anything actively to prevent corruption at his workplace he is regularly offered bribes but he refuses but he does not know why he refuses he has no definite agenda and he has no definite belief that what he was doing is right for example when kumsan the minister invites the man and his wife to his luxurious house they go and they enjoy the luxury of kumsan's house and when while they are returning in the luxury car of the minister the man wonders whether he is right in refusing uh, to accept these goodies from a minister whom he knows is very corrupt so the man is not really a man who is in search of truth or man who is in search of uh, honesty etc he is simply a man who is unable to be active in terms of preventing corruption all he seems to be worried about is that he should not be a part of the corrupt uh, uh, regime himself so the